me ask you to turn in your Bibles today to Genesis 17. Genesis 17. We will not be reading the entire chapter. Uh, you're welcome to read it, but we will not be reading the entire chapter. We'll just be reading verses uh, 1 through 10 because the bulk of what we're talking about is found here in verses 1 through 10. Genesis chapter 17. Again, we're going to begin our reading at verse 1 and read through the 10th verse of Genesis 17. Now, let us give careful attention to the reading and hearing of God's most holy word. Genesis 17, 1, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I, might make, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Keep your Bibles open before you. This is God's word. The grass withers, the flower fades. The word of our God shall endure forever. Let us pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are indeed a covenant God. May we better understand exactly what is involved in that this morning. And may we commit ourselves to our covenant relationship with you. Lord, we ask your Holy Spirit that inspired these words to take these words, illumine them to our minds, and sear them into our hearts. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever interacted with someone whose behavior displays commitment issues? Of course you have. We all know what it's like dealing with people who literally sprint away from the fact that they need to invest time, and money, emotional capital in, well, the workplace, at school, at church, in a relationship. And to some extent, all of us struggle with commitment. Well, if you are, you know, well, somebody I know, you know what that usually is code for? Somebody I know, it's code for you. If you or someone that you know struggles with commitment, you'll be happy to know that one of the major differences between this God, this God revealed in the Bible, and other gods in Bible times is this, the Lord God that we worship, the Lord God that we serve, this God has absolutely no commitment issues at all. Our God is a God who commits himself to his people. 
As a matter of fact, verses 1 and 2 highlight a, a major contrast between the Lord Yahweh and all the imposter gods, and that's this. You know, in the ancient world, with the exception of one nation, that is Israel, there were no covenants between deities and humans. You read about other religions in the world, in the Middle East, and Abraham lived. You discover other gods, they just demanded worship. And if these other gods did anything for you at all, which they wouldn't, it was only if you sufficiently groveled at their feet. It reminds me of the incident in 1 Kings 18, when the prophets of Baal were dancing and and cutting themselves and saying, Oh, Baal, hear us, hear us, hear us. And went on doing that into the evening. And no response. They just kept begging, hoping for a heavenly handout, and there was no response. But that's not so with this God. This God is a covenant God. We see how committed this God is when we observe the focused, repeated use of the word covenant here in this chapter. Did you know the word covenant is used 13 times in this one chapter? What is a covenant? Simply it's this. It is a binding agreement where both sides of the agreement agree to do something. A binding agreement where both sides of the agreement agree to do something. It's like, in our day, signing a house note, or car note, or getting married. Both sides commit. Friends, the Lord Yahweh relates to His people by covenant. Because this God is willing to commit Himself to you, His people. Friends, this God, unlike any other God, is a unique covenant God. That is even wrapped up in the name Yahweh, our Lord. In Genesis 17, what we see here is three practical implications of what it means to have a -a one-of-a-kind covenant God. Three practical implications. And the first implication is this. Having a covenant God implies a God who will mystify us. That's right. A God who will mystify us. Now there's time lapsing here between chapter 16 and 17. Notice the last verse of chapter 16. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. And then notice the beginning of chapter 17. When Abraham was 99 years old. Now, unless my math's really off, that's 13 years. And time just keeps marching on, rolling like a river to the sea. Verse 15, notice this verse. God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give her a, you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Wait, wait a minute. Whoa. You mean there doesn't have to be a plan B? Hagar plan? It's Sarah. Notice, Sarah. Chronologically challenged, which is politically correct for old. Barren. Disappointed. Sarah. Time and time again, he talks about Abraham and Sarah starting up what would be nations upon nations. It's like he seems to be saying, that's my story and I'm sticking with it. But you know what? The Lord takes the long way. And because of that, we're not too happy about the way the Lord takes, are we? Friends, have you noticed in the Bible... God never seems to be in a hurry. Hear that again. God never seems to be in a hurry. Remember Howard Hendricks, great Bible teacher, one of the best from Dallas Seminary. 
He made the observation after studying the Gospels for over 20 years. He says, you will not find one place in the Gospels where Jesus is in a hurry. He's never in a hurry. But you know, for us, the time between the promises of God and the fulfillment of God's promises, it's a problem, isn't it? You know, when we roll around in the mud of an impatient culture, we get muddy. If the truth were known, we prefer a deity with high blood pressure, on the move, a deity who promises his promises are hustled out with microwavable instructions. To be totally honest, we don't care much about working with a deity who puts his savory promises into the crock pot, crock pot and slow cooks them. But there's another truth here. If you look at the gap here, 89 years, 86 years, 80, 99 years. Did you notice here between verse 16 of chapter 16 and 17, did you notice all the razzle-dazzle going on in Abram's life during those 13 years? You didn't? Or perhaps that's because for 13 years, Abraham's life was quite ordinary. 13 years, you know, of, of doing exciting stuff. Like, you know, hosting family reunions, getting goat's milk for morning cereal, tending to livestock, brushing teeth, getting over the flu, going shopping at K. Rogers, that's Kroger's, oil changes, running off copies at the office or office depot, carpooling, getting allergy shots, visits to the eye doctor, visits to the orthodontist, music lessons, dance lessons, buying a casserole from Sugar Magnolia. Friends, that's life. Life, just daily for Christians. So here's a question for you. Can you deal with the ordinariness of living in covenant with the Lord. You know, some people have a problem with this day-to-day -day ordinariness of the Christian life. Some people's emotional stomachs growl for a religion on steroids, full of aesthetic spiritual highs, with all the bells and whistles and smells and bells appealing to our emotions. You've seen it. People will leave one church to go to another one because that church is boring. I want to go to an exciting church. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we must ask ourselves, can I find contentment in the ordinariness of the Christian life and just put one foot in front of another day after day after day? If you can't go there, your covenant Lord will continue to mystify, maybe even annoy you, because God's not in a hurry. He's going to fulfill His covenant promises, but not according to your timetable. So God basically says to us, in a very nice way, deal with it. Notice in the second place, not only does having a covenant God imply a God who mystifies us, but notice in the second place, having a covenant God implies, this is the second implication, it implies a God who blesses us with the best blessings. Verses 3 through 8, verses 15 and 16 that we read, they, they rehearse God's special promises. And I want to, let's just put our fingers on the pulse of verses 7 and 8 and Let's feel the heartbeat of God's covenant promises. Notice, notice there's the promise of an unfading inheritance. Look at verse 8. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of, of Canaan. And notice this. For an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now how's that going to happen? 
It's going to happen because the inheritance envisioned in this verse is a future inheritance. It is an inheritance received after death. Now, you know, in our lives, someone else dies and we receive their inheritance. For Christians, we are the ones who receive our inheritance from the Lord after death. And when you read this promise in verse 8 in light of Hebrews eleven sixteen 16, that, that Abram was longing for a better land, and when you read this promise in light of 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it's talking about inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade, you begin to discover something. Yes, right here. God is telling us there is life after death because if Abraham is going to receive the land, literally, it must be after Abraham dies because he never received the land on his life, in his life on this earth as we know it. And the use of the word land here reminds us of something else the Bible tells us all throughout Scripture, and that's this. Heaven is not ethereal. It's not immaterial. It's not vapor. It's not pie in the sky, cool whip. Heaven is material. Heaven, hear, hear this. Here's the definition of heaven. Heaven is the life after life after death. Let me say that again. Heaven is the life after life after death. It's life in a restored and steroided new heavens and new earth. You can read about it in Revelation 21 and 22. In other words, even death cannot ruin your inheritance. Now, one day when you die, you'll die hoping your inheritance will be handled correctly. But as many lawsuits can testify, a lot can happen between the writing of a will and the execution of a will. But when it comes to our inheritance... Nothing can stop us from receiving our inheritance right here in the new heavens and new earth. You know, in history, even amongst all the chaos and destruction before the fall of Berlin in 1945, did you know there were two operations that continued without a break? Even during all the governmental chaos, two operations continued. You know what they were? the keeping of records, and the production of beer. Both operations, according to the German government, were deemed as essential operations. Lesson for us from this chapter of German history is this. Even in a fallen world, there are some things that even war, destruction, and death cannot stop. Nothing can cancel out the everlasting inheritance all of us descendants of Abram, Abraham will receive one day. So you have the promise of an unfading inheritance, but you have something else here, another promise. Look at verse 7. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you for an everlasting covenant. And what is it? To be God to you and to your offspring after you. The second promise is the promise of an indescribable gift. And that gift, friends, the gift of the covenant is God Himself. I ask you this what could be better? God is saying here in verse 7 I will be for you, I will exist for you, I will exercise my Godness for you. I will be committed to you. Let me give you a, a poor but I think accurate analogy. Ladies, when a man promises to be your loving and faithful husband, remember these vows, the man finishes by saying this, in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health, as long as we both shall live. In other words, darling, honey, sweetie pie, 
receiver of my final rose. I will be with you, I will be for you, in every circumstance of life, I, as your husband, will be all that I need to be for you, always. Husbands, that's your vow to your wife. And yes, you should be swallowing real hard right now. But it's this kind of committed covenant relationship that time cannot exhaust. No circumstances can change. God will, will never say to you, I, sorry, I can't do this any longer. You can just leave your suitcase. I'll just leave your suitcases on the steps outside the house. God won't say that. No, no disaster can destroy this relationship. No catastrophe is able to crush this relationship. And even if other people abandon you, God says, I, this covenant God, will stick closer to you than Velcro laced with Gorilla Glue. Now imagine someone giving you a really large bag of diamonds finest diamonds in the world. Imagine just reaching into that bag and picking up handfuls of diamonds and just letting these diamonds run through your fingers. Just enjoying the sheer pleasure of all that precious wealth running through your fingers. The covenant promises of God are better than that. God's covenant promises are better than the finest cut diamonds, so enjoy the sheer pleasure this morning of letting God's covenant promises of an eternal inheritance, of being your God, always being committed to you, let that run through your mind. Enjoy it. Savor it. God mystifies us. He blesses us. Notice the third implication of having a covenant God is this. Having a covenant God implies a God who wants us to embrace his covenant. You see, God expects a response from us. He wants us to embrace his covenant in a particular way. Look at verse 1. It says, I'm the Lord God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And then, in verse 10, This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you, your offspring after you, every male among you shall be circumcised. I want you to realize, before we begin this discussion we're about to begin, our covenant God is not one of those no-obligation gift cards gods. You know, you get a no-obligation gift card from Belt. Nothing required, just enjoy shopping. No, Remember, a covenant is a relationship with mutual obligations. So, in light of verse 10, I want to cluster bomb this verse with several questions. And the first question is this. Basically, what is circumcision? Well, let me explain it very simply. Circumcision is, in two words, covenant branding. <clears throat> Excuse me. Covenant branding. Covenant branding. That is, circumcision marks a man out as belonging to God, pledged to his covenant God, and a man who is branded in this way would remember, I belong to God. And God's made promises to me. He, he would remember that branding. It's covenant branding. Which leads us to another question. How is circumcision in Israel different from circumcision of other people in the Middle East? This is important because in every other Middle Eastern country, circumcision either happened at puberty or right before marriage. Kind of makes you wonder why any male would look forward to puberty or getting married. But that's when it was. But in Israel, it is prescribed, look at verse 12. He who is eight days old among you 
shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations. Now, in other words, only in Israel was this done on the eighth day after birth. So, leads us to another question. What's the significance of circumcision? What does circumcision signify? Two words. See, I'm just boiling this down. Circumcision signifies covenant commitment. Circumcision signifies covenant commitment to the Lord. For men, this was a formal sign that you have committed yourself to the Lord. This was a physical mark of identity, saying, I belong to the Lord. Let me give you what I hope is a helpful analogy. Think of a wedding band. Man, I want you to look at your left hand. Seriously, look at your left hand. See your wedding band. Put your hand on it. And, I want you, and this is what you should think. This ring means I belong to my bride. This ring means I am identified for me. I'm identified as the husband of Carol Smith Justly. I have a ring on my finger to prove this marriage promise I made back in 1983. This ring is a mark of identity. Yes, this right here tells me I am Carol's husband. It is a significant mark of covenant commitment. So it's a branding. It marks covenant commitment. So how does this right mentioned here in Genesis 17 carry over in our lives today? This is important. It carries over in the practice of baptism. I'll give you some scripture for that in a moment. But this rite of circumcision in the Old Testament carries over in the New Testament in baptism. Now in this church, just to be clear, we don't require that you baptize your children. That's not a requirement. We don't require you to believe your children should be baptized. But we do, however, believe. You need to understand why it's biblical to baptize your children. We saw in verse 12, eight days after birth was the norm. Did you notice that when God said this to Abram, Abraham, he didn't say, Lord, are you sure about this? You know, don't you think we ought to wait until he's old enough to understand what we're doing? I mean, my boy's just going to cry and all that. He's not going to have a clue what's going on. I mean, don't you think he should be allowed to choose for himself? No, not according to verse 12. In circumcision as in baptism, it's the parent's responsibility to make sure the child receives the sign of the covenant. The sign has changed to baptism. The sign now includes males and females. But the pattern has stayed. God desires for children of the covenant to receive the sign of the covenant, which is baptism. Uh, you can see this for yourselves. Jot this down and look it up yourself this afternoon. Colossians 2, verses 8 through 15. Colossians 2, verses 8 through 15. This, this covenant sign, which is in the New Testament now, baptism, this signifies your child is being consecrated, dedicated to the Lord. When you baptize your child, what you're saying is this. First, Lord, he, she, your child. Not ours, yours. And our hope for his future, our hope for her future, is that their heart will be cleansed by the Holy Spirit, even as water washes us clean. So that leads us to a final 
practical question and answer. And that's this. How does baptism affect how we raise our children? Look at verse 14. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. How should we, how does this, how does baptism affect how we raise our children? Here's how. First of all, we celebrate our children's baptism. When they're old enough, we, we talk to them. We tell them what the water represented when it was applied to their head. We tell our children what baptism says about who they are, about what their greatest need is. Ask John or me, we'll be glad to supply you with a copy of the vows you took as parents. You can show your children, we took these vows when you were baptized. Now, I don't know if you'll be brave enough to do this, but you may want to ask us, so how are we doing with our vows? That's pretty scary. But you know what? Your child does have a choice about their baptism. And here's the choice. Will I reject my baptism? Will I cut myself off from the covenant? Or will I embrace the Christ of the covenant as my Savior or Lord? You see, that baptism marks that child as a child of the covenant, but they can still reject that covenant. I hope this conversation never happens between you and your children. But there may come some point in your child's life where you need to say, you know what? Long ago, we put that sign of baptism on you. We marked you out as belonging to God. Now you can still say you want no part of this covenant. You can cut yourself off from this covenant. You can walk away from the church. You can reject your covenant Lord. But you know what else? You're going to face the consequences of that rejection. Like I said, I hope that never happens. I hope your child never rejects the covenant. Now, friends, you may be looking back to your adult baptism. That's good. Or you may be hearing about, because you don't remember, your infant baptism. But either way, your baptism should be a welcome sign in your life. A sign that you have received, the sign of the covenant. Baptism, here's what it does. It claims you for Christ. There's an interesting word there in the Great Commission. Jesus says, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in two the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. That word in two is a banking term. It is an accounting term. In other words, baptizing them, transferring them into the ownership of this company known as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Transfer of ownership into the Holy Trinity holding company. Friends, here's what your baptism says. Whenever you had it. I am not my own. I belong to another. I rejoice in the reality signified in my baptism. Most of you have Facebook. Facebook, there's something called relationship status. Married to so-and-so in a relationship with so-and-so. I ask you this morning, what could possibly ever be as delightful? What could possibly ever be as delightful as being in a covenant, committed relationship with the Lord? There is no higher honor. There is no greater pleasure. There's nothing better than being able to say, 
I belong to the Lord. I'm not my own. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are our covenant God. As our covenant God, you, you are not in a hurry, but you are a God who promises to bless us with, with an unfading inheritance, an indescribable gift the new heavens and new earth, and the gift of yourself, which you give us every day. And the more we understand you and your love and your covenant commitment to us, the, the greater our, our, our desire is to know you and how much pleasure we have in that. But Lord, help us to understand we are also branded as your people. We have received the covenant sign. Lord, may we look at this covenant sign, look back on it. Say, I've been marked out. I'm a covenant child. I embrace this covenant. I belong to you, O oh God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. May we be people who understand that there is no greater relationship ever than our relationship with our covenant Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's conclude this morning as we, our hymn of response is the last verse and chorus of I am not my own. Let us stand and sing. Now receive the blessing of the Lord. Scriptures tell us now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat>